Okay, hi. So, um, well, my thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this workshop. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited. I'm enjoying things so far. Um, I'd like to amend the title of my talk slightly based on current events. Um, so I'd like to call this talk Climate Crisis, Moral Imagination, and Existential Risk. Um, and, uh, you know, this is based on what John Kerry said just this Friday. Um, uh, that we have to end the word climate change and own up to the fact that it is the climate crisis now. So I'm interested in two questions related to the climate crisis. The first one is, what are the responsibilities of climate scientists in managing values and uncertainties in climate modeling? Um, and the second is, why have we failed so thoroughly so far to respond adequately to the climate crisis? And what is to be done about that? Now, um, I'm going to discuss the answer to the first question as part of an answer to the second question. So I'm going to focus the talk really around the second question. Um, okay, so some starting points. Uh, first, um, science, all science, is value-laden. I take this to be a well-established thesis in history and philosophy of science. Certainly there are detractors, but it's one that I'm going to take for granted um, and that I think we heard a lot about in, uh, in uh, Wendy Parker's talk. Um, second, uh, although I won't talk much about this, um, the, the climate crisis is an example of a wicked problem or perhaps a, a, a linked set of wicked problems. Um, and climate science is, a, is an example of the phenomenon of post-normal science. And for reasons of time, I won't say much about these two frameworks. I think they are important to acknowledge. Um, the concept of wicked problems emphasizes aspects uh, of the problem the science is trying to solve that makes solution complicated, intractable, um, uh, controversial, right? Um, and the concept of post-normal science um, from Funtowitz and, and Rabbits emphasizes similar issues um, from a more methodological point of view. Um, but that's all I'll say about that, that point. That's in the background here, but I won't say much about it. Um, the last major starting point uh, that I want to emphasize is that nothing in climate science and climate policy makes sense except in the light of existential risk. Um, if you uh, are familiar with the um, uh, essay by Theodosius Dobzhansky uh, that I'm alluding to here, that's, that's uh, intentional. It's not important that you understand the reference there uh, if you haven't come across it. But I think it's really important, anything we want to say about how climate science should be done, um, how climate policy should proceed, has to be responsive to the fact that the climate crisis is a is a potential example of existential risk, right? And I'll I'll use the definition from Nick Bostrom here. An, ex an existential risk is a risk that's a threat to the entire future of humanity, uh, whether that be through extinction in the most extreme case, uh, human extinction, or permanent and drastic destruction of human potential, say by um, uh, the destruction of human civilization. Right? Now, the climate crisis is a source of such risks is is just a starting point for this talk. I think, um, I think the it's it is clearly such a risk. Um, it's not an exaggeration to say it's such a risk, um, and it's an important part of uh, how we think about our responsibilities in uh, in its wake. Okay, so the question of responding to the climate crisis. Why have we failed so far and what is to be done? Um, I argue that the failures in our response to climate change are not the result of an information gap, but rather a trust gap, a motivation gap, and various failures of democracy. And I'll try to be careful uh, and lead you through what I mean by these terms. By information gap, I mean, uh, you know, a problem where the public and decision makers lack access to the information they need to make the right decisions. 
A lot of people have thought about um, our, our difficulty in addressing the climate crisis through the idea that there's some kind of information gap. But in fact, I think that is not really the problem. I think well-designed surveys um, and research have shown that there, today, you know, maybe as opposed to 30, 40 years ago, there just isn't a major information gap on climate change. Okay. Um, it's not the case that the public and decision makers lack access to that information or lack the knowledge um, that they might need. Instead, what there is, is a trust gap, right? Among other things, is a trust gap. So by trust gap, I mean that although people know what the science says, they don't trust the science sufficiently, sufficiently well to act on it. Um, this trust gap is the result partly of doubt mongering. That's gotten a lot of attention in the last decade. I won't say much about it. Uh, it's, also result part, it's also the result partly of failures of expert transparency, right? What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that climate experts pose as neutral authorities. They represent what they're doing as, as, as value-free science, right? They use language like the IPC's language, IPCC's language, that what they're doing is policy relevant and yet policy neutral, right? But these are not accurate and they're not plausible descriptions of what's going on in climate science. And as a result, segments of the public see climate scientists as stealth issue advocates for essentially liberal or left-wing causes, right? Um, in order to resolve the trust gap, then it's not enough to somehow deal with the doubt mongers. It also, scientists need to manage values in a responsible fashion uh, to be seen to do so, and to be honest about the value-ladenness and political nature of climate modeling. Um, instead of being seen as stealth issue advocates for liberal causes or left-wing causes, um, they need to be what they really are, um, I think that really are responsible, uh, responsibly responding to uh, values and issues that affect all of us. Um, and they need to be, you know, they just need to be clear about the, the values that are, are guiding their work. Um, I provide in my book a framework and a set of uh, ideas for thinking about how to manage values in climate modeling in a responsible way. And the core idea um, uh, for how to do that uh, is captured by what, I, by what I call the ideal of moral imagination. So this is, I think, uh, my attempt to capture what the core responsibility of scientists of any kind is in the face of um, value-laden science. Um, scientists should recognize contingencies, track the relevant values, um, empathetically understand uh, the stakeholders in the situation and their interests, imaginatively multiply and explore options for uh, making decisions and resolving problems, and exercise fair and warranted value judgment in the face of all of those considerations. Now this ideal, and it's an ideal, um, translates fairly directly to a four-part framework for addressing values in science. So the four parts of this framework are the identification and description of a goal or task at hand, right, or a problem to be solved, the options or alternatives for solution, right, the relevant values and moral considerations at work, as well as the legitimate stakeholders uh, in the situation and whatever their interests might be. Um, and uh, as scientists work through this framework, right, they are dealing with a, a kind of iterative and nonlinear process um, here. Okay. So that was the trust gap. Next, I want to talk about another serious problem, which I call um, the motivation gap. The, motiva the motivation gap is that although people believe the science, they trust the science, and they think climate change is a problem, they don't think it's a very urgent problem, and so they don't, they don't vote or they don't work to devote significant resources to its solution. 
Um, I think among other things, the motivation gap is the result uh, of failures of moral imagination. So here, you know, not moral imagination on the part of the scientists so much as, as moral imagination on the part of public, the public and decision makers. And to address the motivation gap, um, we need to work to make sure that the public and policymakers understand that climate, the climate crisis poses sh both short-term probabilities of significant suffering and that it poses long-term existential risks in the sense defined before, and that it, it's something that we can actually ameliorate through various kinds of action. So we need to connect the dots between climate, the climate crisis and short-term uh, problems, as well as help people understand the position that uh, future people will be and the long-term existential risks to the human future. Um, one aspect of this is um, we can talk about the relationship between climate change and pandemics. You know, that's a particularly relevant aspect of the situation we're currently in. Um, you know, we're all suffering through a pandemic. Um, it may be difficult to link the COVID-19 pandemic to climate change directly, but uh, what's not difficult is to show that there are complex causal relationships between um, the, the factors that contribute to climate change, the consequences of climate change, and those things that contribute to the increase in pandemics. Um, Texas just endured a record-shattering cold snap that uh, left millions of people without access to power and clean water um, and uh, created an immense property damage, loss of life, and health. Um, uh, and it, it could have been much worse than it was. Um, now, again, it may be difficult to attribute directly this event to anthropogenic climate change, but we do know that uh, what did cause the event, which is the weakening of, a, of the polar vortex, um, is one example of the kind of instability uh, that leads to extreme weather events like this one. And we can connect those dots better than we do. In uh, his uh, brand new uh, cli-fi novel, The Ministry for the Future, Kim Stanley Robinson dramatizes a near future probable climate disaster, um, which is a wet bulb heat wave event. In his book, it takes place in India, which is one of the most likely places for such an event to take place. Um, and uh, uh, he makes very present the kinds of severe human costs that the climate crisis presents. Um, so that is the way in which we might think about addressing aspects of the motivation gap. And then, of course, failures of democracy. So we have failures of democracy because although the public have adequate information, uh, they trust uh, the science and they're motivated to act. Um, this nevertheless does not generate an ad adequate policy response. Now, one reason uh, for this is that um, uh, we have uh, examples of regulatory and legislative uh, capture um, by interests uh, opposed to uh, action on climate change. Part of it is that massive amounts of our shared world are governed by non-public entities. They're governed by financial capitalism. Um, and we essentially have no control over what goes on there, even though that a huge part of our life uh, is managed by those things. Right? And so we have major failures of democracy um, that we need to, to, to figure out how to uh, do an end run around. Um, OK, so these are the sources of the problem. What are we going to need to do for a solution? The first thing um, uh, that we need to uh, recognize, I think, is that an adequate response to the climate crisis is going to require radical acts of moral imagination on a global scale. Um, we need moral imagination to address the motivation question, as I've already said. Um, we need uh, to increase pr public participation in addressing these issues, which also is going to take a significant amount of moral imagination. Um, we need to expand the circle of empathy 
to um, take seriously the um, uh, the concerns, the interests of those people who are going to be most deeply affected by the climate crisis, including uh, the well-being of, of future generations. We need to have empathy for future generations um, and to help us generate creative solutions, creative solutions to the climate crisis. Let me just mention again Kim Stanley Robinson's recent book as, a, as an example of the kind of kind of imaginative thinking that is necessary at this point to address the climate crisis. Um, the first is uh, this radical and imaginative pr proposal uh, in the book, which Robinson has also been um, advocating for uh, in, in essays and other, um, in other you know, forums. Um, and uh, that's the creation of some kind of uh, quantitative easing uh, policies that will um, uh, reward decarbonization uh, and carbon sequestration. Um, uh, in the book, he uses he uses the concept of a carbon coin currency. Um, there are other ways to think about it, but what this does is it, it turns one of the biggest enemies of climate progress, financial capitalism, into a potential ally by changing the incentive structure. Um, in ways that are more like a carrot than the stick of, of taxation or, or, or uh, other policy regulatory sticks. Um, another, uh, another, you know, kind of thinking that we're going to have to become more comfortable with in the face of the climate crisis, especially the longer that we forego significant action, is um, various kinds of geoengineering. So in particular, um, Robinson uh, popularizes various forms of, of um, glacial geoengineering um, in in the book that we need to um, yeah that we need to think about. Okay, the other piece of the solution to the problem is um, what, how climate science itself is going to have to change. So to play its part, climate science is going to have to undergo a pretty radical set of transformations. Um, in how it operates. Um, one internal and one external, you might say, um, although the two go hand in hand. First, climate science has to change from being a kind of natural history to being a kind of natural philosophy. And um, let, me, uh, let me say a little bit about how I'm using those terms because it's idiosyncratic. So by natural history, I mean the kind of science that is um, descriptive, retrodictive, um, uh, that uh, sort of models the past in order to gain some explanatory and limited predictive um, understanding of what is happening now or what will happen in the future. Um, uh, you know, we think about natural history um, uh, in this traditional way as the kind of qualitative, descriptive, sciences, botany, uh, for example. Um, but I think, you know, astronomy is also primarily a form of natural history. Um, and for the most part, still climate science is a form of natural history. Natural philosophy, what I mean by natural philosophy is a kind of experimental and um, theoretical science that permits not only description and explanation, but significant amounts of prediction and control. Right? Natural history allows us to understand and anticipate aspects of the natural world. Natural philosophy allows us to directly control aspects of the natural world. So, of course, you know, significant as uh, parts of physics and chemistry are paradigm examples of natural philosophy. So climate science must undergo a change from natural history to natural philosophy, and it must not, it must not only be political but become politically active. And that, those two things go hand in hand, of course, because um, the laboratory for climate science is the climate of the earth. Um, and making change, you know, controlling the climate of the earth is a political act, right? So climate scientists can and should become political activists, pol policy advisors, political commentators, policymakers, and politicians. Um, who can guide and engineer the control of the climate that is going to be necessary 
both to prevent further catastrophic climate change and to reverse uh, the climate crisis that we're already heading towards. Right? Um, so uh, those are the main points of my talk. Um, I've laid them out here. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, it's been a pleasure to speak to you.